Ken. We see the James Paxton signing late last night. Starting to get a little more activity. Starting to get a little warmer with some of these signings. I'm going to guess the answer is no, but were you surprised that the Dodgers added yet another starter? Because as much talent as they've brought in, it's not like you look at their rotation and even their starter depth and go, oh my gosh, it's endless here. The rest of the depth after those first five are those young guys from last year. Right, and there are even young guys in the rotation before Paxton was added. So there are a number of questions in that rotation. If you really break it down, Yamamoto is making the transition to the U.S. It won't necessarily go smoothly. It did for Senga last year, but you can't be assured that that's going to happen. Bueller is coming off Tommy John surgery. Tyler Glass now should be healthy now, but he's had injury problems in the past. Certainly, Emmett Sheehan and Bobby Miller are promising young guys, but they are still young guys. Miller is obviously the guy who made an impact last year. So James Paxton adding to that mix is probably a good idea. And Clayton Kershaw, he still stands a chance of coming back if he wants to come back to the Dodgers. They are in a position where they will still welcome him back because, as you guys mentioned, they'll just be mixing these guys, bringing them in and out of the rotation all season long, and Kershaw can simply be part of that mix. Now, let me ask you this about the whole signing. What do you think about the money? I mean, I feel like nowadays, we're, or not nowadays, but this year, guys are signing a little bit more, I wouldn't say overpriced, but they're getting the deals that they want. You know, you think about a Chapman at 10.5, you think of Paxson at 11. Is there something uh, along the lines of this, or is just just the ongoing thing going, and this is what they're worth? Todd, it's no question that starting pitchers in particular have gotten paid really well this offseason. And you go back to Lance Lynn and Kyle Gibson. It started there. Frankie Montas got $16 million, barely pitched last year. Now you look at Paxton. He has not, of course, been a very durable pitcher. Teams want the few quality starters who are available. Chapman is a little bit different. People were surprised by the extent of the salary within the game. People within the game were saying, whoa, this was one team in particular. We thought he was more like a five, six million dollar guy, and he got ten and a half from the Pirates. If you look at him analytically, strikeout rate, velocity, all of the things that you can check on his baseball savant page, he was like in the 99th percentile for quite a number of those categories. So that's why he's getting paid. And yes, the numbers for the right players have been high, but as we've discussed, Todd, there are a whole lot of free agents still out there. And they're not all getting paid. That's just the reality of the market, the supply and demand nature of this. I'm sure there are still some good deals out there. There will be. There are still some really good players out there. But we're going to see some guys who get bid a little bit as well. Now, now to finish off that, is there, could the reasoning also be that you look at the guys in the playoffs who didn't have that four or five starter? Is that could be a possible explanation as well? I don't know if the playoffs are the reason for James Paxton. I don't know that okay. you can count on him for October. But what you're looking at in a general sense, Todd, as we speak more broadly, is teams recognizing we can't just have five. That's not going to work. It doesn't work in today's game. You need probably eight to ten to get through a season. They're not always all of them going to pitch the same amount of innings, of course. But from injuries, from the fact that certain guys need breathers, they might be coming off of injuries. There are all kinds of issues that take place, and starting pitchers are not relied on the same way they were years past. They are asked to do less in terms of innings, but in shorter bursts and in bursts that sometimes don't last for 30 to 35 starts a season. That, to me, is what's driving this. Now, when you talk about a Blake Snell or a Yamamoto, guys with elite stuff, those are pitchers who will be asked to start a playoff game, yes, and are asked to be a difference maker in a playoff game. But I don't know that I would attribute this trend to that as much as teams simply recognizing the need and the shortage of pitchers who can take the ball every fifth day. It's kind of a dying breed in our game. Ken, can I take you back to the Kershaw part of this equation for a sec? Because he's been talked about quite a bit, I would say, by fans, especially Dodger fans, hoping that he stays with the Dodgers um, for the rest of his career, which we don't know how much longer he's going to go. He's coming off big surgery. Do you have any inclination on if it's Texas or L.A., if Texas is even real or it's more just in our heads because he's from Texas? And I'm wondering, you know, if he does sign this offseason versus 
waiting at some point till he's maybe more medically cleared. So any thoughts on what could surface with him? Oh, good question, Scott. Texas is real in the sense that they've talked to him in the past, past free agencies, and they have talked to him again this offseason. He is, of course, from the Dallas-Fort Worth area. He still lives there, and I'm sure it's entered his mind from time to time. It would be kind of cool to pitch at home, have my kids right there with me instead of having to move them to L.A. for the summer. The other part of that, he's spent his entire career with the Los Angeles Dodgers, and, of course, the idea of retiring as a Dodger has to hold a certain appeal as well. What we know about Kershaw is that he probably won't be even a factor until – after the All-Star game at the earliest. So I still see him as a Dodger because we don't know where Texas is going with Jordan Montgomery, with their finances in general. Texas would want to sign Kershaw even though they have three other pitchers, all of whom are pretty accomplished. Well, two of them are in particular, Max Scherzer and Jacob deGrom. And then there's Tyler Molly. These guys are all coming back after the All-Star break. So even with that, the Rangers still would sign Kershaw, and even with the possibility of getting Jordan Montgomery, we'll just have to see where this goes. And I imagine, Scott, it is possible that he waits and waits until later in the offseason, even into the season, to make his decision. But I would expect it would come before then. Ken, free agent signings. Aroldis Chapman to the Pirates, $10.5 million. They signed, also signed Rowdy Telez. They made some moves, Marco Gonzalez, some other moves. Bob Nutting came out yesterday and said, we're going to be competitive. Is Aroldis Chapman, Rowdy Telez, Marco Gonzalez enough to make the Pirates competitive? And what the f- hell is he talking about? <laughs> oh. Well, you forgot Martin Perez. And- oh, also, yeah. Mm. Uh, yeah. Exactly. I don't know if it's enough to make the Pirates competitive. They need their young players to take a step forward. There's no question about that. This is year five under general manager Ben Sherrington. The first of those years, of course, was the COVID season in 2020. And it is time for them to make some progress, show some progress. We saw it the early part of last season, but now we need to see more, I would think. More pointedly, owner Bob Nutting needs to see more. So Chapman with Bednar in that bullpen and some of their other pitchers, Holderman, They have what looks like it could be a very formidable bullpen. They have promising young offensive talent. There's not much doubt about that. I don't love their rotation beyond Mitch Keller, Perez. Maybe he bounces back and is good. Marco Gonzalez, fourth or fifth starter at best at this stage of his career. So we'll see where they are. The Chapman signing is interesting because it does signal for them a desire clearly to be more competitive. These other moves to me were sort of fill-in moves for the most part. Obviously they brought McCutcheon back too, that's good. But we have yet to see the Pirates really spend money. And until they do that, I don't know that we'll ever be talking about them as a serious contender. And when you say, well, Ken, they're in Pittsburgh, a small market team. Yes, all true. And it's challenging. But we've seen the Reds step out this off season. We've seen the Royals step out this off season. It's not impossible. It can be done. Another team, Ken, that won't spend any money, the Miami Marlins. How many free agents have they signed this year? Because I can't think of one. Oh, that's right, because they haven't signed any. (laughs) Didn't they make the playoffs last year? Pretty sure they made made the the playoffs playoffs last last year. year. They had the manager of the year in the National League, Skip Schumacher, and yet they seemingly are devoting more time and resources to building their infrastructure than they are to the major league team. And what I wrote yesterday is that that's fine. If their infrastructure was a mess, as pretty much everyone in the organization acknowledges it was, you've got to fix that. It doesn't preclude you, though, from fixing and upgrading the major league team as well. And here's a team that talks about the future and wanting to build something long term. Didn't make a qualifying offer to Jorge Soler, so they cost themselves a draft pick. They just are operating curiously, in my opinion. And that's why I wrote what I did yesterday. And a lot of fans say, well, why not pick this team, that team, this team? Yeah, I could get to a lot of teams and probably will. But they stand out because they are the only team that has yet to sign a major league free agent. Even the Oakland A's have signed two free agents. Now, granted, they signed them. It was Trevor Gott and Osvaldo Bito for a combined $2.25 million. It's not like they're going out on a limb here. But they've done it. 
And the Marlins are sitting there coming off a year in which you thought they generated some momentum, and they're doing essentially nothing. It's unfair. I lived in Miami for a good chunk of time, and it's a tough city to grab attention in any way. The Marlins are at the bottom of the totem pole. They just don't care about their fan base, and this is not just one ownership group. This is multiple ownership groups. They just are are poison. They're unlucky. So, And I can say that because I live down there, and I'm pissed about it too, Ken. So uh, my question, though, is, is though, yeah. It is difficult to grab the attention of fans there. There's no question. There's a lot to do in Miami and – it's a big city. But at the same time, here you are. You're the Marlins. You've maybe got a chance here. You've maybe got some momentum because you made the playoffs last year for the first time in a full season since the 2003 World Series. And yet, you're not building off that. You're just simply saying, that was fine, but we're not that good. And yes, they had a great record in one-run games. They didn't score a ton of runs. There was some degree of luck involved in their season. But that doesn't mean you concede. And you step back, and yet that's what they're doing. And the way to also grab attention down there is to have some star power, okay? that There was, in this you know recent decade or so, there was no more star power than when Jose Fernandez was on the mound. Obviously had many connections to that city, and they really you know gravitated around him. Not the same example, but Jorge Soler is a legit 40-plus homer guy. He's a Cuban player. There are a lot of people down there that really were starting to be like, hey, I like this guy. This is like our our big power bat. He's still young enough. They don't give him a qualifying offer. This also ties into the article you put out this morning in The Athletic about DHs kind of waiting for phone calls. So just curious why the Marlins would not be entertaining. I, I know the easy answer is they're cheap, but why they wouldn't be entertaining someone like Jorge Soler to build around and why in general he doesn't have a team. I think he's a, he's going to have a huge year just like he did this past season. And I think he's underrated. Of all the DHs that I listed, I would say outside of JD Martinez and maybe Justin Turner, he's the most desirable. And those guys are desirable for slightly different reasons. Justin Turner, because he's such a powerful force in a clubhouse JD, because he's JD and he's still really an accomplished hitter. Jorge Soler though is younger by a good amount than both those guys. He's 32. And I'm with you, Scott. He should be in demand. But I know he's only a DH, and DHs aren't as va- valued as highly as a player who can do both things. But if I'm the Marlins, I'm staying in touch with him, and I'm saying, okay, you're still lingering out there. What's the price? I don't know that they're doing that. I don't know that they're not. But just because you didn't give him a qualifying offer doesn't mean you still can't sign him. And they can sign him. He'll end up somewhere. He'll probably end up somewhere with a pretty good deal. There are a number of teams I listed in an article that could be looking for DHs. But the Marlins, I would not expect them to sign him. Okay, so I've been wanting to ask you this questions ever since I saw your face today. The Hall of Fame voting is pretty much done. Or not pretty much done. It'll be announced, I guess, 6 o'clock. So everybody should have got their votes in today um, by the end of the day. I'm excited to see who everybody voted for, the votes that haven't gotten picked. We know you came out and showed your votes like you usually do, you, right? Right. Yeah, you're not afraid. There's a lot of guys that just don't want to show it. Okay, whatever. Do you think there's going to be some snubs? Do you think, you know, like there's a guy like – I want to talk about Gary Sheffield. He's a guy that, like, is on that border. People, whether they like him or not, in my opinion, I think he's a Hall of Famer. I'll go out there and say that with over 500 home runs. Is there a guy like him where you see him not making the list, you know, just because of percentages reason? Well, I heard AJ at the top of the show, so I'm here to speak for all the biased, despicable, <laughs> irrational, unreasonable, <laughs> idiot writers. He and forgot some adjectives. Represent that group. <laughs> so, <laughs> got some. Jeffield, Jeffield is a guy that if you're going by the Hall of Fame tracker that Ryan Thibodeau puts out there, he's right on the border and usually, Todd, when the announcement is made and the actual vote is revealed, the guys come in at less than what they were showing at the tracker. Mm-hmm. For whatever reason, that's always the trend. So I do expect him to miss. It's his last year on the ballot. I voted for him. He's an interesting candidate. He's a divisive candidate in many ways. I don't know that the steroid thing, which was really small with him, if anything, holds him back as much as the perception that he was a one-way player. He was a slugger and a Great slugger, all-time slugger, but defensively he didn't do much. And that, to me, is something that probably holds him back. In my view, 509 home runs, the bat waggle, all that, 
supersedes everything else. It's just enough for me. But I can see where some voters don't feel that way. The other guy that I'm looking at that I'm not sure is going to get to 75% is Billy Wagner. And I'm basing this again on where he is with the tracker. He's right above the threshold, but right above might not be good enough because, again, the vote totals or the percentages are going to drop once we get the actual announcement. Billy Wagner, in my view, is a Hall of Famer. And I say this all the time, you've got to consider closers as actual players and judge them accordingly for their position. It's not like there's some subset of baseball animal that we separate. They're real baseball players. And Billy Wagner, I know he only threw a little over 900 innings, but he had an all-time great strikeout rate, an all-time great ERA for his position. And in my view, he should be in. Ken, you mentioned uh, Billy Wagner. He's in his ninth year. Sheffield's in his tenth year. What, what if a guy's a Hall of Famer? He's a Hall of Famer. So why does it take some guys first year guys? Some gears like Per Blylevin got in what his fifteenth year, his last year on the ballot. What, what's the difference? What what changes in voters' minds? Have they just talked into it after all this time? Are they peer pressured into it? Because if you're a Hall of Famer, you're a Hall of Famer, and you should get in. Now, now for me personally, and I, I'll speak on this that I feel like. If you're a first ballot Hall of Famer, you're one of the all-time greats. Like Adrian Beltre to me, first ballot Hall of Famer. I look at the rest of that list, and I'm like, okay, these guys are probably Hall of Famers, but they shouldn't be first ballot guys because they're not like generational stars. Beltre to me was, you know, look at whatever number for third baseman you want to put out there. He's an all-time great third baseman. So what's the difference between a Hall of Famer and then in the 10th year they become a Hall of Famer? AJ, of all the criticisms the writers get for the vote, this is the fairest Well deserved. One. Well deserved. This is, the, this is the fairest one because it is curious to a fan, and I'll try to explain some of the rationales here. There are a number of different reasons that go into it. One is simply that the ballot for many years was very crowded, and we're only allowed to vote for 10, so you weren't getting all of the players you want on the ballot in your particular vote. And as players get inducted, as players fall off the ballot, you could add guys. So that's why you will see guys show up in their fifth or sixth years. The steroid era also complicated things. For many years, I didn't vote for Clemens and Bonds. And eventually, I just decided, well, there are guys who we believe use steroids that are in the Hall of Fame. And these guys are alleged to have used it. And that's why I'm going to include them now. And I draw the line with others. But that is also a factor. Another thing, and this is, again, something that I understand a lot of people might not understand. I try to keep an open mind every year and try to take in as much information as I can. And Burt Blylevin, you mentioned him, he's actually a great example. As time has gone on and as the sabermetric movement has taken hold in the sport, we've come to view certain players differently. And Burt Blylevin is one that certainly we developed a greater appreciation for as a voting group as the sabermetric movement basically enlightened us. So that happens too. And then there are situations where over time you just feel differently about a player. And maybe another player gets in and you say, well, if he got in, then I should look, about, look at this one differently. And then finally, and I know I'm giving a lot of reasons here, social media pressure is a thing. And the pressure also to not be the guy to exclude or the woman to exclude a player if he's that close to the Hall of Fame. You have people who bark at you on social media when you release your ballot, which is fine. That's all part of it. It's deserved in many cases, and it's just part of it. But at the same time, I do believe some voters kind of get queasy about it, and their votes are influenced accordingly. I, I want to ask this one, the last one for the Hall of Famer for me question. Two guys. You see a guy like David Wright. He, he's top five in some numbers as third baseman. Um, you know, he's, he's got a lot of years go to go to get to stay on this ballot. Can you see him moving up uh, as the years go on, depending on what the Hall of Fame ballot looks like? And then a guy like A-Rod, you don't have to dive deep into it, but it's only in his third year. Um, you know, could be a hot subject to talk about. He gets to his sixth, seventh, eighth year. All of a sudden, the, some people change, you know, your mindsets because his numbers were good. You talk about steroids, this and that. Could you see some possibility of those two guys climbing the ranks? David Wright's a really interesting one. And actually, he ties into AJ's question as well. Now, I didn't vote for him this year. I do believe he's going to get the 5% necessary to stay on the ballot. And as players with less volume maybe get more consideration, 
I'm talking about Joe Maurer to some extent, but really guys like Chase Utley, Andrew Jones, some others, guys who don't have the counting numbers, the longevity, then perhaps David Wright you look at in a different way. And voters start to say, okay, maybe we should be acknowledging players who had these extraordinary peaks in a better way than we have in the past. I can see the case mounting. I don't think his case is quite as strong as Utley's, but it's pretty good. And he's a guy that I didn't think much about until Jason Stark wrote about him in The Athletic a couple of months ago and said, we need to look at this guy. And I would agree with that. A-Rod, I don't know that he's going to get in ever. And the difference between A-Rod and Manny Ramirez and other players who are alleged to have used steroids, let's use Bonds and Clemens as an example. A-Rod and Manny Ramirez were suspended by baseball for using steroids because they violated a policy that came into effect while they were playing. So after the rules were in effect, after the penalties were in place, these guys still did it. And for me, that's a hard line to cross. I, I have a hard time knowing that they consciously, willingly continued or took steroids, performance-enhancing drugs, and kept going, knowing that the sport officially sanctioned them for it, or was going to officially sanction them for, the, for it if they were caught. That's where I draw my line. Other voters don't draw the line there and say they're fine, everybody is fine, and I vote for all of them. But I remember that time period when A-Rod was fighting, when he was suing everybody, when he was lying. And it's just hard for me to say, okay, I'm going to make him a Hall of Famer when his career, his accomplishments are very much in question. And it's just a tough one for me. I'm 1,000% on the same page on that front. Ken, thank you very much. And also for FT fans, if you want to get more reaction after they make those announcements official and we find out who's in, hit the uh, FT YouTube channel and you'll hear some reactions from AJ and Ken and myself. And then lastly, also Ken's back tomorrow with, should I say who it is? Should I reveal it now? The special guest joining us for like a little Hall of Fame reaction among other things. AJ, you want to announce it? Don't say it. Am I being told don't say it? Oh, oh, go for it? Okay. AJ, why don't you say it? Well, as certain people used to call them in Baltimore, the Twin Towers are joining us tomorrow. <laughs> Ken Rosenthal and Tim Kirchin are going to play a one-on-one -on -one game and also discuss the Hall of Fame ballot. Well, I lose the one-on-one -on -one game, or I lost it many times with Tim. Tim's a great basketball player. <laughs> well, guys, I lost listen, I'm coming on tomorrow. Newspapers. I'll be on Tim's with Ken best. tomorrow. We'll have a really good time. <laughs> <laughs> I might have to come on. Yeah, now. exactly. Yeah, I think I might. It's going to be good anyway. So for people to see, we'll wrap all that up tomorrow with Tim Kirkerton <laughs> joining uh, Ken and, and the rest of the FT crew. So Ken, thank you very much. We'll catch you later. Thanks, guys. And also Fair Territory is up there for you on YouTube and wherever you get your pods. As you can see, there's some Hall of Fame conversation, but uh, the Josh Hader signing, the A's planless 2025. Um more on Kershaw, State of Print Media's good stuff in there too on the Sports Illustrated um, madness that went on.